uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, as I said, my name is um, Azumi Antakara. I go by Anne. Um, I am a fellowships and grants advisor, um, and among my portfolio um, of advising is the uh, the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. I also advise for the uh, Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Fellowship Program. So for those for those of you um, among the audience who are PhD students and are looking for uh, funding to uh, uh, applying for the Fulbright to uh, to do a part of your dissertation research. Um, here's another opportunity for you uh, that will be coming up later in the year uh, that you might be able to apply for. Um, I also advise on the Fulbright Scholar Program. This is for uh, people who are done with their education and they have their PhD or have an equivalent terminal degree. Um, a little bit about my background. I'm a sociologist by training. I have a PhD in sociology, um, although it's been a long time um, since I've actually done any active research, I don't really keep up with um, with research anymore. Um, but um, uh, I do have that background. Um, in terms of kind of a regional specialization, I'm an East Asian studies specialist uh, with a particular focus on Japanese studies. Um, I am a Fulbright alumna. Um, I received a uh, Fulbright Hayes doctoral dissertation research abroad fellowship uh, when I was doing my PhD dissertation, and I spent 12 months in Japan doing archival research on on the Japanese um, uh, corporate system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about my experience um, finding um, uh, finding a host. Um, affiliation for my uh, Fulbright year um, a little bit later um, in this presentation and that can kind of give you an idea of um, uh, you know how um, how this uh, this process of I'm um, looking for a host affiliation for your Fulbright um, uh, you know might work for you all right so um, jumping right in, um, the agenda for this session, um, I will start off with a very brief um, overview of the Fulbright U.S. Student Program, and then uh, we'll you know, delve more specifically into the topic for this afternoon. Um, talk about, do I need a host affiliation for uh, my Fulbright application? And if I do, uh, what are uh, some search strategies and resources that are available to find a, uh, find a host affiliation um, what are some of the tips um, I, and tricks as far as approaching potential mentors, um, especially um, if you don't have an introduction um, or know this person already? Um, and then we'll talk um, also a little bit at the end about uh, the specifics of the affiliation letter requirements uh, for your Fulbright application. All right. So, um, Going right in, um, so a very brief um, overview of the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Um, if you need more details, um, you should come to one of our other info sessions or watch one of the recordings of a previous info session that we did during the winter term that's posted on the Canvas site um, that will give you a little bit more details uh, about the um, uh, about the program. But very briefly, um, the Fulbright U.S. Student Program is for um, somebody who has a bachelor's degree. So, graduate, uh, so applications are open to graduating seniors, recent graduates, um, and graduate students, as well as early career professionals, um, including um, creative performing artists and musicians. Basic eligibility, um, you need to have U.S. citizenship by the application deadline. Um, you will need a bachelor's degree by the time um, your um, award starts. Um, so basically, um, if you're graduating within the upcoming, um, the next 12 months, um, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, the latest possible time usually is um, August of 2024 uh, for the current cycle applicants. You will need to have your bachelor's degree uh, by the end of the spring summer term 2024. Um, no doctorate at the time of the application. So if you're in a PhD program and you're kind of um, finishing up, um, uh, you cannot be done with your doctorate and have that in hand um, at the time of the application deadline. Um, if you're in the situation, um, instead you should be applying to the US Scholar Program and I'd be happy to talk to you individually about that, um, uh, about how that works. Um, there are country specific requirements um, in terms of eligibility. Um, and so you should look at the um, country award profile. Uh, it's on the National Fulbright website um, and read those carefully uh, for 
um, any additional eligibility requirements um, that are specific to a particular country and a particular award. Okay. Um, in terms of award types, uh, Fulbright um, US program comes in two ba really basic types, um, a study research um, award, uh, often also called the Open Study Research Award or the English Teaching Assistantship. Um, these are um, kind of the fairly, um, uh, fairly recent numbers as far as number of awards available um, and how many countries um, have these awards available. Um, you will find specifics of which countries have which uh, types of awards and how many, um, again, posted on the, uh, the Fulbright National website. If you go and look at each of the country profiles, you will see um, exactly what types of awards um, and how many potentially are available in, um, um, in, in, um, in that country. Um, not every country has every type of award available. Um, so you do need to uh, pay attention um, to uh, these, these descriptions and make sure that uh, the award, the type of award that you're interested in is available in the country that you're interested in going. Um, it's important to keep in mind that you may only do one application to one country um, for one particular type of award. The exception are the, the handful of awards that are configured to work in multiple countries. Um, there are only a handful of them. So the vast majority of these awards are um, a single country, single type of award um, per application cycle. Okay, application components very briefly. Um, so there's an online application that asks for your basic personal data and program information. Um, and some short answer questions. Um, you will need to write two essays. Um, for the first one is called a statement of grant purpose. The second one is called a personal statement. Um, if you were the, the country that you're um, applying to requires a foreign language, they will need to get a foreign language evaluation. Um, in addition, you will also need uh, three references. Um, you will need to do transcript uploads. And then um, for a research study application, you will, um, most likely need a, a one, at least one affiliation letter or potentially multiple affiliation letters. And we'll talk about the details of exactly what that means um, in a few minutes. Um, and then if you're an RNRT applicant, um, there are specific requirements for uh, supplementary materials, which is your um, arts portfolio. Um, Award benefits, I'm not going to talk about these in return, uh, these in detail, but these are some of the things that are available. If you are selected to receive a full light um, award, these are some of the benefits. In terms of the application timeline, um, the U of M campus deadline is August 27th. That's a Sunday, um, it's a Sunday night deadline, but it's an online deadline. So you'll do an online submission, then click the submit button on your online application. And so it's due Sunday night. Um, the national deadline is October 10th. Um, that's a 5 p.m. deadline, absolutely no exceptions. They are very strict about this, um, this deadline, so please keep that in mind. And then the, in terms of the selection process, um, the Fulbright has a two-stage selection process. The first stage takes place within the United States, and then the second stage, if you make it past that, the second stage of the selection uh, process takes place in your host country, the country that you will be going to. And then the final notifications will come out, come out in next spring, um, as early as mid to late March. And most of the award notifications, the vast majority of them will come in April, um, but it can um, run into, um, uh, into May and sometimes even into June, especially if you're selected initially as an alternate, and then uh, you might get an upgrade well into the summer months. So um, that's the real brief um, overview of the Fulbright um, program. And we're going to um, talk more specifically about host institution affiliation. So do I need an affiliation letter? Well, the answer is, um, as with a lot of um, answers to these kinds of questions for the Fulbright program, well, it depends. Um, if you're applying for an English teaching assistantship, no, you do not need an affiliation letter. They will find a placement for you and then assign you to a location or a particular school or a university or a group of schools, and that's going to be your assignment. So they're going to take care of that. So if you're applying for an ETA, an English teaching assistantship award, then you do not need an affiliation letter. Um, if you're applying for a 
study research, one of the study research grants, um, regardless of what you're applying to do, whether you're doing a graduate degree, um, independent research or the arts, you will need an affiliation letter at some point during the application process, although the exact requirements um, do um, differ somewhat by the type of award that you're applying to. So let's go over um, exactly what that means for each of these types of awards. So if you're applying to do a graduate degree, uh, to enroll in a graduate degree um, through the Fulbright, um, we, uh, regardless of whether you're applying to one of those specific Fulbright awards that are designated for, let's say, a master's degree or a PhD degree, um, or whether you're doing an open uh, open study research um, application and asking to go and do a graduate degree program. If you're going to be enrolled in a graduate degree program, then your graduate degree institution will be your host institution and your graduate admission letter is going to be your official host affiliation letter. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that uh, regardless of what type of Fulbright you're um, applying for to do a graduate degree, whether you're doing a specific um, kind of a partnership award that's tied to a particular university and a particular degree program, or whether you're doing the open study research, um, you must do two separate applications, the Fulbright application, which is going to cover your funding, and then a separate graduate admission application directly with your, um, with your university. So that's important to keep in mind. You have to do both applications. Um, and depending on the timeline for your particular degree program, you might be doing them simultaneously, or you might be doing the Fulbright first and then your admission later. Um, it really depends, but you're going to apply for your graduate degree program on the schedule that is specific to the graduate degree program um, that you're going to be applying to. Um, the letter, um, your official affili uh, affiliation letter, um, is not required by the application deadline because it most likely you are either applying simultaneously or after your, uh, your uh, um, full right application for your graduate admission. It's not likely that you will actually have an admission letter in hand by the national deadline. So the letter is not required by the deadline. But um, at a later point, if you are selected as a semifinalist or if you are um, if you're selected either as a final uh, finalist or, not, as an, or an alternate, then at that point you will need to um, you will need to provide the official um, letter of admission to your graduate program in order to go further um, in um, in the um, uh, in the award process. So you are uh, they will not finalize your award until you provide the official uh, letter of admission um, uh, to your graduate degree program. So. Um, so if you're doing a graduate degree, um, just as a summary, um, you're not required to have a letter by the application deadline, but later down the road, before your award is finalized, finalized you, will need to, uh, you will need to have an official admission letter for your graduate degree program. Okay, um, if you're doing an independent research application, you need to have at least one host institution. Um, exactly what kind um, of a host institution qualifies that depends, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Um, you may have more than one affiliation. I believe you can upload up to three um, affiliation letters uh, to your online application. You're not required to have more than one, but you need to have uh, you need to have one, and you may have up to three. Um, you must secure your own host affiliation, um, uh, so you will need to do some research and look um, and do some looking. And most countries and awards require at least one letter by the national application deadline. Um, again, um, the specifics of the requirement do vary by country. There are some countries that will say you must have a letter by the deadline. There are other countries that say strongly recommended by the deadline, but not necessarily required. Again, please go and read the um, country award profile on the National uh, Fulbright website, and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do uh, for the country that you're applying. Um, if you're doing an arts application, um, and you're going to be starting an artistic skill or technique either in an organized program, let's say at a, like a conservatory or an institute, 
um, you 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 will want a um, letter of affiliation from that 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 program, they, either the conservatory or institute or whatever that program is. If you're going to be kind of studying with an individual artist instructor, then you'll want a letter uh, from that individual who's going to be your um, instructor for that particular skill. Now, in addition to that, the that letter um, uh, about your specific um, artistic skill or technique and who you're going to be studying with, you may, in addition, need another um, academic host um, host affiliation. Whether you need one or not depends on again depends on the country. Uh, there are certain countries that require that you be affiliated with a university. Um, and again, it will tell you um, on the um, country award profile. Um, again, um, same as the other um, independent research, um, since you're, doing, you're both doing the open study research application, you may have more than one affiliation. You can upload up to three letters um, and you must secure your own affiliation. Okay, so um, specifically, um, what are the requirements for a host affiliation? Uh, Again, as I keep mentioning, requirements do vary by country. And so read the country award description on the Fulbright National website, and it will tell you in the affiliation section exactly what is required, um, required for that country. And um, we'll, in, in a couple of minutes, we'll take a look at a couple of examples and see what, what it says. Um, what are some of the possibilities? Um, accredited public or state university or college, those are acceptable for pretty much all of the, um, the study research um, applications. In addition to uh, public universities and colleges, um, some private universities and colleges are also acceptable for most awards, but uh, not necessarily all. Um, in addition, um, government laboratories, research institutes, museums and archives, those are also possible in many countries. Um, you know, private think tanks, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, um, local offices of international organizations like the United Nations or one of the UN, uh, UN um, programs. Those may be a possibility, but are not always acceptable as a primary affiliation um, in some of the country. So again, um, read the descriptions um, on the national website and it will tell you um, exactly what's required. So let's go take a look at a couple of these. Um, I pulled these out, um, pulled these um, this morning. And so this is um, uh, this is example number one. This is India. Um, and so for each of these um, study award um, study research um, award description pages, you will find a section called affiliation and that's what it looks like. And so for India, it says independent study research, letter recommended but not required at deadline. Okay, so here's the a case where letter recommended but not required at deadline. Okay, and then additional details, location details. Affiliations available throughout India except for uh, Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, so there are location restrictions um, in India. Uh, so you can go everywhere except those two, um, two locations, Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and then, again, full riders must be affiliated with institutions, organizations of higher education approved and listed on the website of the Ministry of Education, Government of India, including institutions accredited um, AICTE, UGC, and other apex level bodies of the ministry or medical institutions accredited by the Medical Council of India. Okay, so here's a fairly specific description of what kind of institution that they're looking for um, in terms of a host affiliation. So um, there's a link to the website. Um, and if you go to that link um, of the Ministry of Education um, at the government of India, um, you can see that there are uh, further links to these accrediting organizations and each of those accrediting organization websites will have lists of institutions that are accredited by each of those um, so-called apex level body uh, of accreditation for, for the ministry. So uh, fairly specific instructions uh, of exactly what they're looking for. And then further note in the second paragraph, note says full writers cannot be affiliated with non-government organizations, NGOs, 
think tanks, research organizations, or other institutions that are not rec recognized by these regulatory bodies. So here's a restriction that says you must be affiliated with one of those universities, accredited universities. These other possibilities, um, those, those are not going to be um, considered um, as an appropriate affiliation institution for um, uh, if you're applying to, uh, if you're applying to go to um, India on an open research um, application. All right. So here's one, uh, one situation. Okay. Example number two, this is from South Africa, much shorter. Um, so independent study research, this one letter required for independent study or research at deadline. So uh, if you're applying to South Africa, you must have a letter and it must be with your application at the national deadline. Um, applicants must identify in an education institution, research facility, or other appropriate institution for their projects. They're required to include affiliation letters and or research clearance letters with their application. Affiliation is possible at any of the 26 universities in South Africa. Affiliation, affiliation with other public or private institutions will also be considered. Um, and then there is the um, uh, applicants are encouraged to contact the U.S. Embassy Fulbright office if they have any questions. And there's an email address. So, um, so this is a situation where um, a letter is required. Um, the possibilities of what might be an appropriate host institution is a little bit broader than India. So for South Africa, they will consider um, universities um, as well as other private, uh, public or private um, institutions. So um, here it looks like um, a kind of government research labs or uh, possibly government offices, um, other research institutes, private think tanks, NGOs, all of those are possible. And if you have a question about whether a particular uh, organization that you're looking at is appropriate for a host institution, you can, um, uh, you can contact the, um, the, the U.S. Embassy in South Africa, their Fulbright office, and you can discuss your situation and whether your organization is appropriate with them uh, by email, uh, emailing them um, uh, and, and asking a question. So um, as you can see, um, each country um, has fairly specific requirements. They are delineated in these um, paragraphs and um, um, and they do vary quite a bit as far as what's required. So do pay attention um, to um, exactly what the requirements are for the country that you're applying for. Okay. So if you now know that you need to look for a host institution, well, um, what do you, how do you go about finding one and what do you do? Um, well, number one, you need to find one that meets the, uh, your country award specific requirements. So do go and look at those and make sure that you're gonna be able to find an institution um, um, institution that meets those requirements. Ideally, what you would like is at least one research scholar who can act as your research mentor for the year that you're on Fulbright. Um, hopefully somebody like a professor, lecturer, or research scientist, but depending on your project, a librarian or museum, museum curator, um, an archivist, or if you're doing an arts ap application, you know, a perform uh, performing artist, um, those kinds of people might also be um, appropriate as a, um, a host, um, host scholar at a, um, a potential affiliation institution. You want somebody who has an active research program or a teaching profile, in other words, somebody who's active in the uh, kinds of things that you're interested in doing, um, and who's going to be hands-on and available during the year that you're going to be on Fulbright. So you don't want somebody who's going to be on sabbatical um, or on leave and is not going to be, you know, really available very much um, to be hands-on um, and be available for you to ask questions and help you and um, introduce you to um, other scholars. If you find that maybe the person that you had in mind is going to be on sabbatical or on leave and not available. One of the things that you might want to say, um, ask is, can you introduce me to other researchers um, who can, who might be an appropriate, um, you know, host for the year? So that might be something. Um, and, you know, ideally you want somebody who is, uh, again, active in a research program so that they can actually provide you 
that introduction and introduce you to um, other people who have similar interests so that you can, um, in addition to working on your own research project, you can develop those connections and networks um, that will kind of um, make you um, kind of go into the community, um, the academic community, as well as the local um, community and get to know uh, the, the, the local area and the country uh, that you're going to as a Fulbright um, recipient. Okay, um, so um, let's talk about search strategies and uh, some of the resources that are available. Um, first, um, and foremost, your local U of M mentors and advisors. Um, use them, uh, ask them questions, um, see if they have um, any um, research partners, collaborators, um, people that they know uh, who are interested in the kinds of things that you're interested in. Um, ask them about who's doing exciting research on your particular um, topic. Even if they don't know specific people, they might know which universities are well known for research on this topic. So get leads, talk to these people, um, ask them, can you introduce me to a colleague who's working on a related topic? Um, you know, either colleagues here at the University of Michigan, um, other you know colleagues at other American universities who might in turn um, inter can introduce you to somebody um, you know overseas. Um, Again, you know, um, use your network, trace all of the nodes and connections in your network um, until you can get to somebody who, who can be a potential um, potential host uh, for uh, for your Fulbright project. Um, another possibility, and this is something that you might actually consider doing, especially if you're working in a um, STEM field where you know things tend to happen in research groups and you need access to um, very often kind of research space in terms of um, it, you need access to a wet lab uh, or bench space uh, where you need to be actually you know, integrated into a, an existing um, uh, project or laboratory um, in order to do the kind of research that you want to do. Um, and there are many existing research, ongoing research groups that are open to short-term visiting uh, visitors um, like Fulbright Fellows. Um, the advantage of the Fulbright Fellow is that the fellowship, the Fulbright um, will pay for, for, from the perspective of the, um, the research group, uh, group that's accepting you as a visitor, um, the, the Fulbright program is going to pay for your, you know, your stipend and your, um, uh, your airfare to get there and back. And so from the perspective of the research group, you're um, sort of a, um, you know, a free participant in the group for the year. And, you know, that's to their, um, that's to their advantage. And um, for you as a researcher um, going into this kind of a situation, it's an advantage in the sense that you have a readily available group of colleagues and mentors that you can work with who are interested in the, the kinds of things that you're also interested in. And so for, um, uh, for if you're working on a kind of a STEM uh, type project um, that's going, uh, you know, that's very much amenable to working in a research group, um, that might be the, the way to start is um, to see if you can hook up with an existing research group and talk to the group leader about carving out a, you know, a portion of uh, their ongoing research project that you can claim as your Fulbright project that you're going to work on for the nine to 10 months that you're there. Um, again, um, it's perfectly fine to be working within the research group uh, for the purposes of Fulbright. You need to, you still need to have your own project that you can claim as your own. So you need to carve out something, you know, within the research group that you're going to be primarily responsible for. Um, that's going that you can claim as your own project, uh, but it's perfectly fine to be working in the context of a larger research project. So this might be a way to go in terms of um, finding a potential host. So first, locate that research group and then work with that group um, to um, uh, to arrange a specific Fulbright project. So in that sense, this is kind of working backwards, but um, it's also a, um, for a certain kind of project, this is an effective strategy. So, um, okay, next, okay. Um, 
In terms of kind of practical consideration, um, so things to remember. Um, uh, so independent research projects require host institution affiliation and a host, um, a host mentor. Um, exactly when you need to get that formal letter of affiliation, that really depends um, on the country specific requirement. It may be required by the application deadline. Um, uh, it may not be. Um, you, were, um, you should also keep in mind that your research project location may be limited by the availability of your host institution and host mentor. There are certain projects that can only be done in certain locations um, and you know that may be a limiting factor and you may need to um, you know you might be thinking that you could uh, you want to go to a particular country and um, uh, and work at a particular university, but uh, it may be that the circumstances um, you know may not allow that to happen and you need to pivot and find another location um, that um, that it's going to work for your project. Um, Another thing to keep in mind in the process of having these discussions with your potential host mentors, uh, that you may find that you may need to alter your research project, uh, particularly if you're dealing with culturally sensitive topics and methodologies, or if you're dealing with politically sensitive topics. Keep, uh, so keep those things in mind um, as you are um, having the um, discussions with your potential host mentors. Okay. Now, in terms of resources that are available, um, in addition to your um, your existing network of um, you know mentors and professors that you know, um, so here are some of the resources that are available. Um, first, within U of M, and then larger um, within the larger Fulbright community, um, the International Institute has a a large collection of what we call area study centers. Um, centers and programs and units that are focused, um, that are subunits within the International Institute. We have 17 of these that are, uh, many of them are focused on a specific rural region or sometimes um, in some cases specific countries. Um, and we have, um, uh, and we have an interdisciplinary community of faculty, students and staff with interest and experience in the rural region. Um, that can tell you and give you leads of um, where you might be go, able to go and what institutions might be your um, host, uh, potential um, host institutions. Um, of the 17 units, I, as I said, the vast majority of them are world region or country specific. There are a handful also that I, are global and cross-regional, but uh, thematically organized. Um, both of these um, centers work at each of the centers um, uh, have, as I said, a community of um, faculty and students st uh, and staff with, um, with sometimes with really extensive experience um, in the world region of the center. Um, you can find a list of these centers from the website here. Um, we'll share, uh, we'll post these slides um, uh, uh, on the Canvas site so you'll have, you don't have to take these down and you can just click on this. Uh, on on um, on the slides afterwards, and that um, site will get you to the list of centers, programs, and initiatives. And there you will find um, a brief um, kind of a explanation of what each of these centers do, and then the link to the center-specific website. Each of those center-specific websites um, will have a um, a people page um, that has all of the faculty, um, especially as affiliated with. Um, with each of the centers and most of the faculty that are affiliated uh, on those um, center websites will have um, fairly um, extensive um, profiles that describe um, the kinds of things that they work on, which countries specifically within the region um, that they work on, and um, and you know again you know contact information for um, how to email them. Um, and most of these of, um, faculty members affiliated with the centers are very much interested in having students go work in their um, region and country of specialization and are very happy to um, give you leads as far as, um, um, you know, as far as potential host institutions. So that's uh, one resource. 
Um, other potential resources of um, the global nature um, within the University of Michigan, the medical school's global reach office has, um, uh, if you work, if you're affiliated with the medical with the medical school, or if you are doing kind of the um, uh, medicine public health type um, projects, um, the global reach office has a fairly extensive um, uh, record of which of the medical school faculty have done projects internationally and who their collaborators are overseas. They also have records of um, international visitors that come to the medical, uh, that come to U of M medical school for long and, and, and uh, for research as well as training. And um, those are also good resources as well. Uh, Center for Global Health Equity is another place. Um, they also have a fairly extensive database of um, affiliated scholars who are interested in um, global health um, and, you know, the kinds of work that um, projects that they work on internationally. So that's another place that you can go to for um, potential leads of um, uh, international projects and contacts. Um, for those of you in engineering, international program in engineering is another place to go. Um, and other um, uh, schools and colleges, each school and college, at least on the Ann Arbor campus, has at least a some sort of an office or at least a person who is the international study abroad uh, contact. And very often that person is very knowledgeable about um, the um, kind of the school college level um, international ties and collaborations and um, things of that sort. So those are also resources for you to uh, look into in terms of locating um, potential, uh, potential hosts. Our library is a great resource. Um, so on the library um, website, you can find research guides. They have a specific research guide for international studies and within the international studies also subdivided to a specific world region and world country, um, sometimes even to individual countries. And so that's a really good place to start. And um, each of those research guides has a subject specialist um, assigned to it that's responsible for curating that research guide. And those are really great people to go talk to. Um, they know, um, they, um, especially the, um, the specialists who are the, um, the international and the area studies specialists who are uh, responsible for particular world regions. They have um, very extensive um, understanding and knowledge of um, the, the way research is done in those, uh, those countries, um, universities, archives, and museums that are out there. And um, so that's another um, resource that's available. Um, and these librarians love to talk to students who are doing research. And so that's another um, resource that's available um, for you to tap into. Now, Fulbright resources. I'm gonna mention th um, three of them very briefly. Um, so the U.S. Student Program has what's called an Alumni Ambassador Program. These are students who have received the Fulbright, done their Fulbright experience, and have come back and are willing to share their experiences of what their Fulbright experience was like and are um, willing to help potential applicants um, with um, in terms of answering questions and uh, providing tips and uh, things of that sort. You can find them on the, um, the Fulbright National website. And um, there is a, a, a Fulbright, each of these ambassadors has a Fulbright email um, address that's posted on that site that you can, um, uh, that you can reach them at. at and um, you should be, um, you, know, you should feel free to um, contact them and ask them, especially ones that have gone to the same countries that you're interested in or have done um, similar kinds of um, projects that um, that you're thinking about doing. You know, ask them about how they found their um, their host institution and their host mentor, and um, uh, and that might be that that might be a, a, a way to get started. Um, also on the National Fulbright website, um, there is a larger, what's called a grantee directory, which is a list of all of the alumni of the Fulbright U.S. Student Program going back um, decades. Um, and um, you can search them. Um, and so you, you can search them by the country that they, they went to. Um, you can search them by uh, the um, 
the discipline of their award. You can search them by their um, if they uh, if they're a, um, you can search them. Um, which of them were um, U of M students who uh, who received grants, um, and um, you can get that information. And uh, for the most of uh, the the recent, I would say 10, 15 years or so, um, you can find um, project titles as well as um, the information about their name and their um, and their. Um, their university affiliation, the, the U.S. university affiliation, if they applied through a university, and um, but um, you're going to have to do some looking um, to find their um, email addresses to contact them because that's not on the grantee directory. But um, uh, for U of M alumni, you can come at them and look in the M community directory, and very often you can at least find their um, unique name um, and um, email them that way. Um, uh, not all alumni are actively using their, um, you know, UMish email ad, um, email address, but very many of them are, are, and you can actually reach them that way. Um, and so that would be another um, resource uh, for you to to ask um, about, um, you know, who did you work with, uh, where was your host institution. Um, the other, um, the um, Fulbright resource that I'm going to mention is the Fulbright Scholar on Grantee Directory. So Fulbright Scholar program I mentioned a little earlier for PhD students who are finishing up their PhDs. This is the Fulbright program for faculty and staff who are um, kind of in the working world and are, you know, done with their education. Um, we, uh, this, um, this directory contains um, all of the Fulbright scholars, both the U.S. scholars who have gone overseas, as well as international scholars who have come to the United States to do their Fulbright. And um, uh, going back to the uh, now going back to the origins of their program back in, uh, in the, 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 the late 1940s. Um, and you can search them by country. You can search them by the host institution as well as their uh, their home institution. And so you can, um, uh, you can, that's another resource. And um, I will mention that um, the Fulbright alumni community, both the student program and the scholar program is very much a community. And most Fulbrighters are very much willing to help, um, uh, help out another potential Fulbright um, uh, applicant. And so, um, so that's another uh, resource for you to look at um, to see, um, you know, where did the where did you know faculty go to do their Fulbrights? And where they where did we um, at the University of Michigan get visiting scholars from? And if they've um, you know scholars who've come um, as as international scholars who have come to the United States as full uh, as visiting uh, Fulbright scholars are very often willing to kind of pay it forward and take in the you know host another um, Fulbright student. So those are again. Um, another um, possibilities um, as far as um, potential hosts. So now that I've talked about resources, let's talk a little bit about how to approach potential host mentors. The first thing I would say is kind of plan a strategy before you just jump into it and do some research beforehand. Definitely do some research about of the institution and the research center beforehand before you start contacting them. Um, do um, have some idea of what the local protocol and the culture is um, where you're going to be contacting them. Um, for example, is it okay to call the email somebody out of the blue and just send an email and say, hey, I'm interested in potentially coming as a Fulbright scholar. Um, is that acceptable or do you need to have an introduction and do you need really like a formal introduction where somebody you know actually ties, um, you know, writes an email and ties you um, to um, somebody over there? Or is it just that, um, you know, something like, oh, I got your name from so-and-so, um, you know, is acceptable? Um, do you need this first um, email to be, uh, is it okay in English or does it need to be in a local language? Um, you know, these are some of the things that you might want to think about. You might want to talk to somebody who's knowledgeable about the local culture and find out before you start actually, um, you know, uh, shooting off an email. Um, 
also, um, especially between, um, you know, as we're heading into, um, it's still early to be summer months, but um, this is something to keep in mind. There are parts of the world that take summer vacation a lot more seriously than we do in the United States. And there are, um, you know, there are entire universities and sometimes entire societies tend to shut down for maybe, you know, a month or two. So do plan around that. Um, and kind of keep that in mind and don't be surprised that once you get to August and um, you might send an email, but you might not get a response until the end of the month. Okay. Um, so do be mindful of the, um, the local protocol and the culture um, as you're um, making these contacts. It does take multiple iterations to make an arrangement. So certainly don't be discouraged um, if your initial email, you know, doesn't get a response right away um, and do consider pursuing potentially multiple reads simultaneously um, and to especially to you know maximize that you're um, you're um, you know be actually landing something that's going to work for you um, so you know do plan ahead and plan a strategy before you start actually jumping into something um, in terms of that initial contact um, keep it short um, but do include um, a little bit about how you got the host researcher's name, I mean, how you found out about them. Give them a brief description of what Fluoride is, um, just a couple of sentences, just so that, uh, just in case that they don't know what it is. And then the brief introduction of yourself and your research interests. And then keep it still general, um, that you're looking for an opportunity to be a visiting uh, student or visiting researcher um, through the Fulbright program. And then um, it asks that, you know, would they be uh, potentially be willing uh, willing to be a um, you know a host mentor for um, your Fulbright um, project? Um, and then ask um, you know if they're you know if they're unable to or if they're not available, uh, can they introduce you to another colleague uh, who might be a good host? Um, so you you know you're mining the network um, again as you're um, in this uh, doing this process. And then finally. Um, you know, do follow up. Um, and as you were, you know, kind of, as you get this kind of an initial, yeah, maybe I'm interested in potentially hosting, then then once you get that response, you can start talking about potential, you know, research project specifics, you know, ask them about access to things like computing or library or lab space, these things that you need to get your, um, uh, get your research project going. Um, and then, you know, talk, discuss the host affiliation letter specifics in terms of what you need. Um, now, keep in mind that the local institutional protocol may require that uh, the affiliation, the official affiliation letter, uh, needs to have the um, needs to come from somebody higher up than the uh, the direct researcher that you're in contact with. Maybe it needs to be signed by a department chair or maybe a dean even. And sometimes, you know, that kind of a process of running these letters through the uh, the bureaucratic process um, may take some time. So do keep that in mind um, as you are making these arrangements. All right, as we start getting ready to wrap up, one final thing, just in terms of specifics of the affiliation letter requirements, what's required in the actual letter um, that you need to get. Um, so the letter needs to be on an institutional letterhead. It can be either a physical letter or a, um, an electronic letter. Um, either way, it's fine, but it needs to be on an institutional letterhead and it must have a signature. Um, so they can prepare a, you know, a, an e-document where they can actually do a physical document and scan that and send the scanned copy. Either, when is a, um, either way is accept, you know, acceptable, but it needs to be on an institutional letterhead and it has to have a signature. Um, so the letter goes directly to you, the applicant, and then you're going to upload that letter to the online application. So it could be that they send you a physical letter that you have to scan and then upload, or they might prepare an e-letter um, and send you the e-letter to either a PDF or um, a, a, a scanned you know, JPEG file or something, and you're going to be able to upload that. Um, so if the, um, the country profiles, uh, the country award profile says that the award is required by the, the, required by the deadline, then your final letter upload must be done by the national deadline. Um, it would be nice if you can get the final letter earlier, um, strongly recommended by the UM campus deadline. But if you don't have the final letter by the UM cam um, campus deadline, that's okay. As long as you can get the final affiliation letter um, by the national deadline in October, 
Um, if you don't have the letter by the U of M campus deadline, what we ask is that you give us some evidence uh, like email correspondence or something um, that shows us that you were in contact with somebody and that the letter um, is uh, that you're in the process of making these arrangements that, and that the letter, um, the letter is forthcoming. Um, if the letter, uh, if the country um, award profile says the letter is recommended but not required, um, again, it, it's not required, you don't have to have one, but if you can get one, the, including that letter will, will enhance your application and it will count uh, kind of as positive points um, uh, in your application. Okay, um, so um, just a real quick, um, I'm just gonna show this to you and not talk about this too much. These are the R, you know, Fulbright applicant resources, our um, website, our Canvas site, um, and, and then our email address if you have any, any questions. Um, again, um, we will post a copy of these slides and the copy of the recording onto the Canvas site. Um, if you pre-registered for this, um, uh, for this webinar, we will also email you um, a copy of the slides and um, a link to the recording when that's available. Uh, so those will be coming. All right.